Welcome to Business Talk, presented in collaboration with the University of Rio Grande and the Ohio State University South Centers, from the heart of southeastern Ohio at the University of Rio Grande TV studio. Our goals are simple, promote the University of Rio Grande and the Ohio State University South Centers, as well as advocate local small business and their support organizations. More importantly, promote Southeastern Ohio as a wonderful place to live, explore, and learn. There are many different ways you can find us. The University of Rio Grande Cable Access Channel 17, live online at blogtalkradio.com, and on YouTube if you are unable to catch our show live. Introducing our co-hosts, Jason Winters, Mike Thompson, Patrick Dingle. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to Business Talk. Thank you for joining us today, uh, Pat. It's it's been a while. I didn't I didn't make the show last week. I, I know we we've been uh, uh, wondering what happened to you. Were you working on the farm? Well, it was something like that. Yes, uh, yeah. <laughs> last week was was kind of a blur, but uh, this week we got a very special guest with us. Yes, we do. Uh, you know, I, I'm quite fond of uh, this guest. Is here. He's done an awful lot for our our campus. And uh, today's special guest is Scott Borden. Scott is our chief of our campus security and police force. Um, and he has some wonderful officers here that really, uh, I'll tell you, at one point, you know, you might be worried about walking around at night. Not anymore. We've got some excellent police officers that are walking the campus. And, you know, they're, they're friendly. Uh, they're outgoing. And I think they actually care for our students. Oh, I, I think so. You know, I, I constantly uh, run across someone that's uh, either uh, – uh, talking with a student or administrator or walking down the halls just to, to uh, make sure that we're safe mm -hmm. and they always have a smile on their face yeah uh, so I, I'm very pleased that at, at uh, the way the, the security uh, on the campus helps us very much so Scott welcome to the show oh, thank you very much now how long have you been with us um, I'll be going pretty close in February. It'll be three years at the campus. My, how time flies. It, it just seems like yesterday that you actually joined us. It has gone very fast. So what are some of the things that we've been doing lately? Well, just to, um, if I may just sort of talk sure. a little bit about the police department, because you guys said some very kind words about it, and just to let everybody know, and you guys know how we got to that point. Um, a lot of people may not realize that the campus police is actually a police department. They're mm -hmm. not nothing wrong with security but they are certified armed police officers and they're armed for one reason and that's to keep the faculty and the students safe mm -hmm. um, one thing that we have unique here that sort of goes to what you guys were talking about is being friendly and courteous and professional is um, prior to to serving here I was 33 years as a state trooper the um, lieutenant who is the assistant chief had 35 years mm -hmm. with the highway patrol and the Dean of Students, Aaron Quinn, had 12 years of highway patrol. So there's 80 years of state highway patrol experience on this campus and probably can guarantee in Ohio and probably almost the United States that there's not another campus that has 80 years of, of highway patrol experience. And what the highway patrol brings, besides the fact you hope it's professionalism, is the things that you were talking about earlier is they, they're, they're courteous, they treat people with dignity and respect. Um, that's the one thing I've demanded from our officers here, that they treat the faculty and the students with dignity and respect, and they have no other option other than to seek other employment. So they will treat the kids with dignity and respect, and, and I talk to a lot of the freshman groups and tell them to report to me if they don't. We've not had any reports. Um, you mentioned how caring the officers are. We have a very good, mature group now. Um, a lot of them have been police officers other places. Um, one of our officers Jason Lyons was actually a police chief in a uh, New Straitsville so when you have some guys with some maturity and you have some guys that have bought in and to what's going on with the professionalism and the the treating people with dignity and respect you have the group that we have now that as you guys discussed earlier you know are friendly and care very much about you guys and the students you know it, it's uh, interesting <coughs> Most of the, the common people uh, uh, that are, are in Ohio are only times that we really see highway patrol is, is some kind of traffic ticket or, or things of that nature. But highway patrol really uh, are not just those individuals looking for speeders. 
they do a lot of behind the scenes um, uh, assistance, uh, making sure that uh, uh, the public places are, are safe. You, you know, Absolutely. They, um, they guard a lot of the state facilities. They actually do a lot in the prison systems. They do all the investigations in the, the state prisons. Um, unfortunately, as being a trooper for so long, is that the thought is, well, there's those guys that give you the tickets. But they're also the guys when your car's broke down or you got a flat tire or you're out of gas or your, your car's overheated that they'll come and help you. And that's sort of what we've tried to incorporate here. We've got a couple um, services that we provide. We, if your car battery is dead, you need to jump, you left your battery on, whatever, we have a jump box where the officer will run out and jump your car for you. You don't have to call AAA or your parents. We, if you lock your keys in your car, which several <laughs> staff have, and um, probably three to five students a week have done that. They've got a device that 99.9% .9 of the time can get your car unlocked. Um, cost 150 to 175 dollars to get a locksmith to come out and change your locks so that's a good service um, for lack of a better term we have an escort service I'd like to find a better term <laughs> but that is our term we um, young ladies or even the way the world is now guys that are having issues with ex-boyfriends girlfriends um, husbands wives anything or young lady just comes out of her out of her classroom and sees somebody in the parking lot that concerns her you call the campus police they will walk over bring the golf cart police car and take them to their dorm take them to their car take them to their class the same thing goes for faculty you're having a problem with a student and you come out and there's a guy standing in the parking lot that makes you a little bit worried you call the guys will come over and get you where you, where you need to go hmm. I, I I think that's a, a very valuable service I, I know that the campus here at the University of Rio Grande uh, houses a number of different buildings and is spread uh, quite large. We actually have 39 buildings, which would surprise a lot of people of how big the campus is. And it's it's and one of the things we try to do is have a lot of coverage. We we have I try to get out and walk around a lot. And the thing you want is a visible presence. If, if you know, you mentioned the Highway Patrol. We the thing me and Aaron Quinn always sort of throw out there is when you're coming down 35 and the speed limit 60 and you see a trooper sitting in the crossover what do you do you slow down even if you're going 60 so what our theory is is if they see uniformed police officers walking around that the bad guy leaves a thief who's getting ready to steal something leaves or somebody getting ready to have a fight or do something stupid sees a uniformed officer and they move on so that's why um, you'll see our officers walking around a lot, like you had mentioned earlier, going through the, the administration buildings and the academic buildings and walking around because we just always want them to believe that there's just always going to be a physical presence. Hmm. How, see, we're, how we're many really, officers do we have now? We actually have six full-time, um, five officers, a lieutenant, myself, and then a secretary, and we probably have three or four part-time that fill in, work the ball games, soccer games, uh, basketball games, dances, uh, fill in when people are sick or vacation. So, so counting me seven full time. And I, I know that you have a number of different parking lots uh, throughout the campus. Yes. Uh, some of them are for visitors, and some of them are parking at this campus. I tell the freshmen should not be confusing. It's probably the most simple. I mean, there's universities you can drive around for an hour and a half and never mm -hmm. find a parking spot. And there's some that you have to get on a bus from your parking lot to get to the campus. But, you know, here everything's flat. There's probably 500 or more parking spots than there are students. Um, if you go behind the line center, there's two levels. You go mm -hmm. behind Bob Evans, there's two more levels. So there's plenty of parking spots but what gets most of the students in trouble is they're running late to class it's 8 <laughs> 29 they need to be there at 8 30. so the only spots available are the handicap the faculty or the visitors and those are the three things that gets most students in trouble so and i always tell them if you don't park if you got a handicap sticker you can park in a handicapped if you don't don't park here if you're not faculty don't park there when you become faculty you can't park there. that's right because I'm all the way in the back in of the that back. parking lot today <laughs> Visit oh, I thought it was just me <laughs> visitors confuses a lot of students because visitors lot is for the parents the brothers the sisters friends of the kids that are staying in the dorms the 300 some kids because mm -hmm. our expectation is not the parents come to visit their child 
and they have to park two miles away. Uh, you know, they should be able to park next to the to, to the dorms. And they're also for prospective students and, and mm -hmm. people with business on campus. But a lot of the students will park there because it's closer to the mm -hmm. building. And that's where most of them end up getting their citations. And we have a lot of visitors, too. We have senior citizens that stop in and use our cafeteria. Uh, yes, and they end up parking you know, much farther right. away than they need to because the students are pretty inventive. They will, because it's pretty easy. You go to the visitor's parking lot and you see a Bevo Francis student pass. You know that's a student parking, but many of them will take their pass off and hide them under the seat, put them in the glove box because then that makes me look like a visitor. Oh. So that's how desperate they are to park right next to the building. So, And so, if you're a student listening to the program, you didn't hear that. Well, we actually had one that came in today. Who got a ticket in visitors and they said they they forgot to hide it under their seat uh, <laughs> heroin told them that's not oh. a good defense <laughs> so, so. but it was honest at it least was, we it was honest, them with being honest yes, it was. well we actually my best one ever on appeal because there is an appeal process if you do get a ticket and i'm the judge jury and executioner on it so my rule is if you come in and you're civil you um fall on your sword, say you did it, and you promise you'll never do it again, typically the first one will be on me. But the visitor one that I get all the time is, I'm a commuter, so I visit every day. So I can park in the visitors, so that, right. that doesn't fly either. So, <laughs> so begging does help. Begging helps, it does, <laughs> as long as they're civil. <laughs> I, I understand. Scott, I'd like to go into another topic now. You know, this goes back to training and keeping all of our, our officers up to date. And you mentioned your relationship with the Highway Patrol and how close that's been. We did something very unique here on campus just a month or so ago, and that was an active shooter drill. And I know that gained some state recognition. Why don't you tell our listeners a little bit what we actually did in the training that went on? Yes, um, in August we had about probably 14, 15 troopers came down. Um, um, eight or nine members of the State Patrol SWAT team, which is, is, is an excellent group. Um, four or five people from the academy staff came down, and they took our officers, some sheriff's deputies, um, some Rio Grande Village officers, people that would be the first responders here. And we went over to Wood Hall, um, got some good volunteers like Pat here to, to be victims, and, and basically ran them through scenarios that would happen if we did have an active shooter and as um, Patrick will tell you it's it's it was very realistic it was even though the guys knew that they were paint bullets it stressed not only because you probably felt some stress too as a as a victim but the officers obviously you could see felt stress they um, blared music in the hallways they um, played the 911 tapes from the Colorado um, movie theater shooting mm -hmm. so that the officers and they weren't aware this was going to happen they were just thrown into a hallway and said go find the bad guy and they had bleeding people in the hallways had people running out of room saying help me help me and all of a sudden this music Ozzy Osbourne's blaring and and um, the 911 tapes from the Colorado thing is blaring and then they have to go find the bad guy and not get shot themselves. So it it allowed uh, a lot of interesting scenarios. Uh, I I know that Mike's wife, Deb, w mm -hmm. was involved, uh, and uh, she was quite the ham. Yeah, there was a uh, oh a triage setup because you can't send in your EMS personnel uh, into a hot zone, so the building has to be secured. Now, before the building is secured, the officers may have to do a little uh, triage and first aid. So that was the area of that. And she was supposed to be the crazy person who has like a scratch on their finger and thinks they're going to die and <laughs> trying to just uh, distract them. And so they have to control her while treating somebody with a serious wound. Uh, and and uh, it, it was a, a very good exercise. And yeah, I think they gained a lot out of, especially that part, because they're not used to doing that. Well, not only the officers and not only um, people like Patrick and Deb who saw it in a different light is we had some RAs and some students that were able to observe, and they just had a tremendous different outlook on 
this like whole a stuff. newfound respect? A or? newfound respect is the right word. Um, we had one of the RAs said that it was her best day that she'd ever had in college mm -hmm. because she had never seen anything like that or realized. I got two emails from two of the, the, the staff members that played victims that said that they had a whole different view of law enforcement now and the officers because they didn't realize how dangerous it was. So it was good for everybody. Um, there was a state rep on campus that, that observed some of it and, and made mention at a meeting later in the day of how proud he was that Rio Grande was out in front and that the state patrol was there cooperating with him. So you know, I think there's a what I saw as far as the difference between the state patrolmen who are used to doing this and some of our, our local cops is just that f fear, overcoming the fear of jumping in a room where you know there's a guy with a gun. Yes. You know, they just had to, like, boom in there, pick out the target, and go. Well, that, that, that's a new philosophy, isn't it? Yes. Um, it's called active shooter, which it's actually called direct to threat. Active shooter is the actual shooter. The, the strategy is called direct to threat. You go to the sound of the gunfire. The average school shooting now, and unfortunately there's so many of them that, you know, if you watch TV, unless there's dozens of people killed or injured, they're not, they don't even get much TV time. But the average school shooting now is two to three minutes. You know, to take you back, Columbine was 49 minutes. Um, Virginia Tech was nine minutes. Uh, Sandy Hook was 100 seconds. Uh, he fired from first shot to last shot was 100 seconds. First police car pulled in about three minutes and 12 seconds and it ended as soon as the, the officers pulled in. So what the goal is, because in the past law enforcement just surrounded the building with overwhelming force. That was a law enforcement strategy forever. If you watch, I always tell the kids, you watch a bank robbery movie on TV. Right. Something always goes bad. Someone sets off the alarm. The cops show up. They take hostages. You're surrounded. And there's 3,000 cops around right. the building. Cont yeah. Containment. Containment. You didn't want the bad guy to get out. But what law enforcement obviously figured out after Columbine and Virginia Tech is while they were surrounding the building with overwhelming force, the bad guy was in there shooting people. So now what they have found is uh, almost, if not 100% of the time, at the first sight of a police officer, the bad guy either shoots himself, gets arrested by the police, or is shot by the police. So it ends. And that's why the goal is, and that's why we had that group of local officers, because when anything happens, and you know, we all hope that day never happens here, but if something happens, you don't wait for backup, you don't call and surround the building, you go direct to the sound of the gunfire, whether it's one, because you saw a lot of the, the tandems, they were doing one person things, two people. If they had more time, they were gonna do three people. But if it's just me or one officer, you go to the sound of the gunfire, and the hope is, that has been successful, as soon as he sees the officer, he either ends his own life, the officer is able to confront him and arrest him, or, at the worst case scenario, which is my least favorite scenario, they start shooting at the officer. Now, while that's my least favorite that they're shooting at the officer, they're not shooting at you guys as staff and they're not shooting at the students because we signed up for that, you guys didn't. You guys signed up here to be educators. The kids signed up here to get an education. They didn't sign up to get shot at. So if somebody has to be shot at, it should be us. So, but by making your physical presence known as quick as you can, and that's what you guys saw in the scenarios, those troopers kept saying, go find the bad guy, go find the bad guy. And the hope is it ends. And Sandy Hook's a prime example that, you know, the guy did that mayhem on those little kids for, you know, for 100 seconds, and the first police officer pulled in the lot, he, he ended the scenario, so. I, I, I would imagine that uh, for a police officer, even though you're highly trained in shooting a, a gun, you're highly trained in uh, the uh, the ways to take down a known criminal, et cetera, being placed in an active shooting as they were, I, I would imagine it would be very unnerving for even the best of individuals. And, and even the shooter in that situation was a fellow policeman, so he was very well trained at hitting a target not like some of these kids who come out with a you know so they knew that who, whenever they popped in the in the room 
there's a highly high likelihood that they're going to get hit. <laughs> well, if they didn't come into the room right. Right. Because um, a lot of them, they, they have, you have to come into the room without your arms exposed, and if they got their arms exposed, they got whacked in the arm with a with paint bullet, which was supposed to be a reminder how you'd do it. But you're absolutely right. And that's the reason for doing it, and that's the reason for the loud music and the, the you know, I've been a part of some of them when I was on the patrol at some Willisburg High School did one before I retired that used the whole student body. And they actually turned the lights off, set the fire alarms off, had flashing. I mean, it's like sports or anything. Panic is ensued when you're not properly prepared or something hits you by surprise. A police officer running into a building, seeing students and faculty that they know or have seen shot and injured is going to be traumatic and what that drill was is to get them that they still have a mission you know even if you got people crawling grabbing your legs saying help me and <laughs> you're shocked because you see somebody you know who's been injured that by blaring all that music and and doing all the stuff they did they've seen that now now so if that day ever happens they're not going to be shocked and sort of mike's i talked to his gateway success class is that's what we talk to the kids now about defending their classroom so that if something does happen, that guy is planning on panic. When he walks into the room or into the building, he thinks everybody's going to scream, cry, yell, and, and just panic. So if they have some type of plan that we talk to them about, then you hope that the panic doesn't totally overcome them. So, hmm. so we're talking about self-defense. So let me bring up another subject that uh, a lot of people – 10, 15 years ago really wasn't an issue, but you've got a lot of good Samaritans out there that can legally carry. They've got their concealed carry permit. What would you say to them? I'm going to guess that you really don't want them to interject themselves into a conflict. You're talking about on a campus, right? Uh, well, on a campus, we know it's illegal because yes. even with a concealed carry, you're not allowed to be on campus. Well, there's a movement, obviously, across the country to get where you can have concealed weapons, and Mike and I have had this discussion. Right. Um, Personally, from my point of view, when I – police are taught when they come to the scene, the only people that have guns are the bad guys and the guys that you know to be good guys. Mm -hmm. And what I see from a police officer's perspective is, say you had two or three concealed weapon people in, a, in one of the academic buildings, is when we come into the building, I know who the cops are. Right. And I see somebody with a gun, I don't know that he's a concealed weapon, good right. citizen trying to help. You assume he's the bad guy, and it causes too much identification issue in my book. Another issue you have is, is I would have to think most people that get a concealed weapon are very, I mean, Mike and his mm -hmm. wife, I mean, they're very sharp people and right. very conscientious, but... You know, I always related to driver's license. How many people that you see driving should not have a driver's license? But they do have one. <laughs> so how many people with a... Everyone that's near me on the, <laughs> on the road. So how many people with a CCW will sit in a classroom and not take care of their gun, not have the safety right. on, leave it in their book bag so someone else can get it? Plus, a lot of things we depend on is if there's a confrontation, either with another student or a faculty member. They're angry. They want to hurt the faculty member or something. Part of that cooling off period is they don't have access to a weapon. They have to get in their car. They have to go get one. And the hope is by the time they get there, they think, well, this was a bad plan. I'm not going to do this. Right. If they have access to one, that changes the whole part of the game plan there. So You, you know, you, you're bringing up some very good points about uh, people and their emotions and, and being of, of rage. I, I noticed that uh, we're getting into a lot of different areas concerned with bullying. Uh, and um, I, I know that uh, people do pick on people, and and people are not conscious sometimes of of uh, the mean words that they say. You want to talk about? Yeah, yeah, Pat. You're you look funny in your mouth. Might have dressed as your beard. <laughs> See, I'm being bullied. Am I not? <laughs> It, it, is, it is a problem that surprised Coming over from the State Patrol, it's one of the things that surprised me the most because I guess my thought as being an outsider of a college or a university is when you got out of high school, that stuff was over with, the, 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 the calling, name-calling and stuff like that. But 
you know, traveling around to other universities for their security meetings and everything, everybody has the same issues that, you know, when you have dormitories and residents and, and that some of that carries over and you've got with Facebook now, texting. Uh, I was going to say that. I'm, I'm sure social media propels a lot of It has of propels it, it a lot because somebody will call somebody else a bad name on Facebook or Twitter they will get offended and their friends will call them back um, that's the bad thing about now as compared to when I went to school if I got called names and bullied or whatever at school I could go home mm-hmm. and it ended until 8 o'clock the next morning when I was back in school but now you go home you're on Facebook you're always faced with it you can't escape it Yeah, and the drama just yeah it's, it's, drama. it's all drama it's yeah. the right word it's the drama and the kids, for whatever reason, because they'll come in and say, this girl keeps saying these bad things about me on Facebook. What can I do? I want them to go to jail and stuff. And you can't. As long as they don't make, at 12 noon at the gazebo, I'm going to find you and beat you. A specific threat, you can do something. But if they just say, call you a bad name and make fun of you, you typically have to have a lot of evidence and where they sent it from and everything. And they say, what should we do? And I would say... Don't look at your Facebook. Delete them. Block them, yeah. Block them, and they will be appalled. Like, I can't do that. You know, I have to to read Facebook. So they weigh this. Am I going to take this verbal abuse over not looking at Facebook? And they choose to continue to look at Facebook because they're addicted to it. Now, we have a a zero policy on on bullying here. Um, And now, if a student is being bullied, do they come directly to you, or do we have our dean of students involved? What's what's the process for a student that may be out there and and is facing this? There's several options. One, if they want to address me, obviously they can come to me, and I'll be very concerned. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't want to address that one-on-one, but we have an anonymous tip line. We have an anonymous email line that can't be traced. Um, They can go to the dean of students. and they do that a lot. And a lot of people take, sometimes they go to the nurse. so Or go, actually, to your faculty member if you feel, mm-hmm. I mean, if you had a student that was being bullied and they felt comfortable going to you, mm-hmm. then and the hope is that you would report it to myself or the dean of students. But once it comes to the point that you're the victim and you start thinking, I'm scared, you know, I don't want to come here anymore, you know, I don't want to live anymore, I, you know, my life's not happy anymore, you need to do something because yeah. we will do whatever we can. Myself, and that's the positive advantage of having Aaron Quinn as a former trooper sure. in our relationship is, I mean, we will do everything we can to squash it as soon as we become aware of it. It's We immediately call in any Facebook, any threat, anybody that reports it. I mean, probably within an hour, whoever is the suspect will be in with us. Well, uh, just recently in the newspaper uh, or on the the TV, there was a young lady. uh, She was in high school and was tormented by uh, two other individuals, and and then she committed suicide. Yes. And unfortunately, uh, to make the the situation even worse, those two individuals, what, 14 and and 12? 14 and 12 are going to be charged with uh you know some with a major felony yes it'd be some type of manslaughter or or conspiracy and you know a a lot of times when you get the person who's doing the the trash talking and everything they believe it or not don't even realize they just are being mean they don't anticipate that maybe that kid that they're tormenting parents are going through a divorce maybe a parent just you know passed away um, some type of family just broke up with a longtime girlfriend something like that that's already caused trauma in their life and then what they do is see someone just making fun of them you know um, and that's the last straw and they don't ever think they were the last straw so yeah so so i have to be nice to mike and, and jason yes it's, you will that's all there is to it <laughs> we'll or s- stick aaron quinn on you well scott i'd like to personally thank you for what you do for the university and all of your officers we greatly appreciate the service you have to the university um this concludes our show today uh next week we have donna mitchell uh, dr don donna 
Mitchell. And Donna is one of our deans here at the university, yes. and she's going to be talking about her school. Yes. So thank you for listening today. I'm Jason. I'm Patrick. And I'm Mike. Thanks for watching.